Let's look at an example of this first category of reasons for why there's so much recent interest in cognitive biases and cognitive bias training. When you use the term seriously negative outcome, the death of a five-year-old child through starvation at the hands of his own grandparents certainly fits the description. I want to warn you, this is a disturbing case, but as you'll see, I actually have some involvement in it. This case occurred in Toronto, Canada in the early 2000s. Jeffrey Baldwin and his older sister were removed from their parents' home by Children's Aid Society workers in 1998 after allegations of abuse were made against his parents. That same organization, the Catholic Children's Aid Society, gave custody of the children to their maternal grandparents. Jeffrey was just over a year old at the time. It turns out that the Children's Aid Society had handed these children over to a pair of psychopaths with a track record of child abuse, but they didn't do background checks on the grandparents, even though the information was available in their system. The home they were placed into had six adults living there and six children, including Jeffrey and his sister. But Jeffrey and his sister were singled out for neglect and abuse, for reasons that are frankly still a mystery. They were kept locked in a room upstairs with furnace vents shut, and when they were released, they were forced to eat with their hands from a mat on the floor, and they're called pigs. They drank from a toilet. The other children in the home were well-treated, relatively speaking. It seems that the grandparents used Jeffrey and his sister as a source of money. They received social assistance checks from the government for their care. And that was their main reason for keeping them around at all. When the daughter was older, she was allowed to go to school, and she got snacks at school, which probably saved her life. Jeffrey was slowly starved to death. In 2002, he died from septic shock and pneumonia caused by sleeping in his own waste when he was just shy of his sixth birthday. At the time of his death, Jeffrey weighed less than he did when he was one year old. The grandparents were put on trial and found guilty of second-degree murder in 2006 and sentenced to 20 years in prison, 22 years for the mother, actually. They appealed the ruling, of course, and the coroner's inquest into the case couldn't conclude until after the court appeals had run their course, which wasn't until 2012. So the final inquest and jury's report on the case didn't come out until 2014, 12 years after his death. The jury in the coroner's inquest into Jeffrey's death issued a broad slate of 103 recommendations aimed at closing various gaps in the system that the inquest had revealed. The most glaring oversight was the failure of the Children's Aid Society responsible for the case to check out Jeffrey's grandparents. They both had previous convictions for abusing children. But the entire system seemed to suffer from a blind spot when it came to assessing the extended families of children at risk. So what does this horrific case have to do with cognitive bias training? Well, recommendation number 51 in the jury report required that the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Societies update their training programs to include themes that had emerged in this case. And one of those themes, which I've outlined in red here, refers to, quote, the dangers of cognitive bias and the importance of re-evaluating conclusions on an ongoing basis and in light of new information. So the report recommended cognitive bias training for caseworkers as part of a broader strategy for improving the system and preventing this sort of tragedy from ever happening again. I know that's a long way to make my point about avoiding bad outcomes, but I'm also mentioning this case because I was the guy that the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Societies called to develop and deliver a training webinar on cognitive biases for this audience of children's aid caseworkers, explicitly to fulfill this requirement. So I've been involved in this case for some time. Now, this is just one example of a seriously negative outcome. Of course, there are plenty of other examples one could point to. How many of us remember the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster from 1986? The immediate cause of the shuttle's breakup was an O-ring failure. But follow-up reports showed that the problem with the O-rings had been noted as early as 1977, and a string of bad judgments and decisions were ultimately responsible for why the problem wasn't fixed. So this is another case where the decision-making apparatus within an organization wasn't functioning properly and resulted in a preventable tragedy. Investigations into the causes of disasters are nothing new, of course. What's new is looking at these cases through the lens of more recent cognitive bias research. Here's an article with the title, Influence of Cognitive Biases in Distorting Decision-Making and Leading to Critical and Favorable Incidents, which perfectly sums up what we're talking about in this video. This article looks at five case studies, including the Challenger shuttle disaster, an airline crash, a collision between a Japanese destroyer and a fishing boat, and the Three Mile Island nuclear plant meltdown. 
The authors argue that certain sets of cognitive biases contributed in significant ways to all of these disasters. And they conclude that, quote, in addition to human factors or ergonomic approaches, recognition and elimination of cognitive biases is indispensable for preventing accidents, crashes, collisions, or disasters from occurring. So here's a question to think about before we move on. What would count as a seriously negative outcome in the area in which you work? What does that look like? Someone is injured or hurt? Someone dies? A product doesn't sell? A business objective isn't met? You lose your license to practice? Or is it something less tangible, like damage to your reputation or loss of trust in your brand? It's a very interesting question to ask different audiences because the answers can differ so much. I find that reflecting on this question can help individuals or companies to identify weak or vulnerable areas in their work practices, areas where biases can enter and influence how the work is done. The video you just watched is part of a larger course on cognitive biases and critical thinking. You can find it on Udemy. Just click the link on the screen or in the video description to get a 50% discount on the sign up. Or you can find it and many other video courses over at the Critical Thinker Academy, where you can sign up for as low as $3 a month and get access to almost 20 hours of video training on a variety of topics related to logic, argumentation, and critical thinking.